From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power with David Weston. From Bloomberg World Headquarters in New York to our television and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. We start today at the White House. We're waiting for President Biden, who is scheduled to give some remarks about those M1 Abrams tanks that will be heading over to Ukraine. We will bring those remarks to you live when they happen. But that's not the only thing happening on the White House right now. There are reports maybe about a change in the director of the National Economic Council. And for that, we turn to our Washington correspondent, Anne Marie Hordern, who is at the White House. Well, tell us about Lael Brainerd. Yeah, so David, the number two at the Fed might end up becoming the number one voice in the West Wing when it comes to economic issues. Lael Brainerd, her name is really at the top of the short list. So who is going to replace Brian Deese? Interviews are still ongoing. They have not made a decision yet. We should also note, obviously, there's other shakeups. We do have the chief of staff as well looking to exit. We know that um, Mr. Zients will be taking over for Mr. Klain. No one is leaving before February 7th, but Lael Brainerd is at the top uh, of this list. I'm sorry, Anne Marie. Top contender. Anne Marie, the only reason I interrupt you is for the president of the United States. He's now in the White House. He's about to speak. Yesterday marked 11 months since Russia's brutal full scale invasion of Ukraine. <clears throat> 11 months in which the Ukrainian people have showed Putin and the world the full force of their courage and the indomitable determination to live free. And through every single step of this horrific war, the American people have been strong and unwavering in their support. And Democrats and Republicans in Congress have stood together. The United States has worked in lockstep with our allies and partners around the world to make sure you, the Ukrainian people are in the strongest possible position to defend their nation, their families, and against the brutal, the truly brutal aggression of Russia. We haven't seen the likes of this in a long time. The United States and Europe are fully united. This morning, I had a long conversation with uh, our NATO allies, German Chancellor Schultz, French President Macron, Prime Minister Sanuk, and the Italian Prime Minister uh, Maloney. Uh, to continue our close coordination and our full support of Ukraine. Because you all know I've been saying this for a long time. The expectation on the part of Russia is we're going to break up. We're not going to stay united. But we are fully, thoroughly, totally united. With spring approaching, Ukrainian forces are working to defend the territory they hold and preparing for additional counteroffensives. To liberate their land, they need to be able to counter Russia's evolving tactics and strategy on the battlefield in the very near term. They need to improve their ability to maneuver in open terrain, and they need an enduring capability to deter and defend against Russian aggression over the long term. The Secretary of State and the Secretary of, of, the, uh, of uh, the military uh, be behind me uh, are uh, — they, they've been deeply, deeply involved in this, this whole effort. Armored capability, as uh, General Austin will tell you, speak, uh, uh, is, has, been, has been critical. And that's why the United States has committed hundreds of armored fighting vehicles to date, including more than 500 as part of the assistance package we announced last Friday. And today, today I'm announcing that the United States will be sending 31 Abram tanks to Ukraine, the equivalent of one Ukrainian battalion. Secretary Austin has recommended this step because it will enhance the Ukraine's capacity to defend its territory and achieve its strategic objectives. The Abrams tanks are the most capable tanks in the world. <clears throat> They're also extremely complex to operate and maintain. So we're also giving Ukraine the parts and equipment necessary to effectively sustain these tanks on the battlefield. And we begin, we'll begin to train the Ukrainian troops on these issues of sustainment, logistics, and maintenance as soon as possible. Delivering these tanks to the field is going to take time, time uh, that we'll see uh, we'll use to make sure the Ukrainians are fully prepared to integrate the Abram tanks into their defenses. We're also closely coordinated this announcement with our allies. The American contribution will be joined by an additional announcement, including that will be, uh, will be ready to available and more easily integrated for use in the battlefield in the coming weeks and months from other countries. I'm grateful that Chancellor Schultz for providing German Leopard 2 tanks 
and will lead an effort to organize a European contribution of two tank battalions for Ukraine. I want to thank the Chancellor for his leadership and his steadfast commitment to our collective efforts to support Ukraine. Germany has really stepped up. And the Chancellor has been a strong, strong voice for unity, a close friend, and for the level of effort we're going to continue. Supporting Ukraine's ability to fight off Russian aggression to defend its sovereignty and territorial integrity is a worldwide commitment. Not just look, it's a worldwide commitment. Last week, Germany, in Germany, Secretary Austin convened the Ukraine Defense Contact Group for the eighth time. This group was made up of some 50 nations, 50 nations, each making significant contributions of their own to Ukraine's integrity each fully committed to making Ukraine remain strong and independent and able to defend itself against Russian threats and violence. I want to thank every member of that coalition for continuing to step up. The UK, the United Kingdom, recently announced that it's donating Challenger 2 tanks to Ukraine. France is contributing AMX-10s, armored fighting vehicles. In addition to the Leopard tanks, the Germany, like the United States, is also Germany is also sending a, pet, a Patriot missile battery. The Netherlands is donating a Patriot missile and launchers. France, Canada, the UK, Slovakia, and Norway, and others have all donated critical air defense systems to help secure Ukrainian skies and save the lives of innocent civilians who are literally the target, the target of Russia's aggression. Poland is sending armored vehicles. Sweden is donating infantry fighting vehicles. Italy is giving artillery. Denmark and Estonia are sending howitzers. Latvia is providing more Stinger missiles. Lithuania is providing anti-aircraft guns. And Finland recently announced its largest package of security assistance to date. You may remember I was asked a while ago what I think was going to happen. And I said, I let Putin know. He thought that he's going to ha end up with the Findalization of Europe. Well, he's got the NATOization of Finland. He's gotten something that he never intended. Together with our allies and partners, we've sent more than 3,000 armored vehicles, more than 8,000 artillery systems, more than 2 million rounds of artillery ammunition, and more than 50 advanced multi-launch rocket systems, anti-ship and air defense systems, all to help counter Ukraine's brutal aggression that's happening because of Russia. And look, today's announcement builds on the hard work and commitment from countries around the world led by the United States of America to help Ukraine defend its sovereignty and its territorial integrity. That's what this is about, helping Ukraine defend and protect Ukrainian land. It is not an offensive threat to Russia. We are, there is no offensive threat to Russia. If Russia troops return to Russia, they'll be there for the, this, where, where they belong. This war would be over today. That's what we all want, an end of this war in just and lasting terms. You know, our teams do not permit one nation. We're not going to allow one nation to steal a neighbor's territory by force. Our terms that preserve Russia's sovereign, Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity and honor the UN Charter, that's our, they're the terms we're working on. And, you know, these are, the, these are the terms we all signed up for and 143 nations voted for in the United Nations General Assembly last October. So, the United States, standing shoulder to shoulder with allies and partners, is going to continue to do all we can to support Ukraine. Putin expected Europe and the United States to weaken our resolve. He expected our support for Ukraine to crumble with time. He was wrong. He was wrong. And he was wrong from the beginning, and he continues to be wrong. We are united. America is united, and so is the world. We approach the one-year mark, as we do, of the Russian full-scale invasion of Ukraine. We remain united and determined, as ever, in our conviction and our cause. These tanks are further evidence of our enduring, unflagging commitment to Ukraine and our confidence in the skill of the Ukrainian forces. As I told President Zelensky when he was here, and today's his birthday, by the way, in December, we're with you for as long as it takes, Mr. Ukrainians are fighting an age-old battle against aggression and domination. It's a battle Americans have fought proudly, time and again. And it's a battle we're going to make sure the Ukrainians are well-equipped to fight as well. This is about freedom. Freedom for Ukraine. Freedom everywhere. 
It's about the kind of world we want to live in, the world we want to leave to our children. So may God protect the brave Ukrainian defenders of their country and keep the flame of liberty burning brightly as we can. Thank you. Why are you taking this decision now? Did Germany force you to change your mind on sending tanks? Germany didn't force me to change your mind. We wanted to make sure we were all together. That's what we're going to do all along. And that's what we're doing right now. Thank Mr. you. Mr. President, any response to the Pence disclosures of classified documents? We have been listening live to President Biden's giving remarks at the White House, and he ended the way he began with the unity of the allies in supporting Ukraine in resisting the Russian invasion. He announced, as anticipated, that 31 M1 Abrams tanks for the United States would be wending its way, although he said it would take time, to Ukraine along with the supporting hardware. He said that was the equivalent of one battalion. He also specifically thanked Chancellor Schultz of Germany for leading the effort to have at least two tank battalions of those Leopard 2 tanks. And then he went on a litany of how much support there's been. And again, he ended up with how, how much unity there is among the allies in supporting Ukraine. We're reminded, as we listen to the president, not just about the military aspects of this, but also the economic ones, because this has really thrown something of a wrench into the global economy. And to take us through exactly what's happened to the economy because of that, as well as whether we've recovered, we welcome now Laura Tyson. She's professor at the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business and Public Policy. Dr. Tyson served as the chair of President Clinton's Council of Economic Advisors, and then as his director of the National Economic Council. So, Dr. Tyson, first of all, thank you for waiting with us, listening to President Biden. But as I say, give us your uh, snapshot uh, of what effect on the economy, domestic in the United States, but globally, uh, the, this war in Ukraine has had. Well, I actually think the main channel through which the war in Ukraine has affected the global economy is probably the uh, adding to inflationary pressures and supply chain disruptions that uh, you know, supply chain disruption in, in agriculture, which led to inflationary pressure in food, uh, supply chain disruption, reconfiguration in energy and the higher energy prices. So I think the way this has really shown up in the global economy is the inflation and therefore the efforts by the central banks to uh, actually engineer a, a a soft landing out of an inflationary environment. So let's talk about that soft landing, uh, quite apart from the war in Ukraine. Uh, as far as I can tell, there are conflicting signals that we're getting right now. The the employment situation seems very strong, although I think temporary work is, is wending its way down. At the same time, retail sales are down. So I'm getting conflicting signals. What do you make of all those signals, and what is the likelihood at this point of a soft landing? So... I think, interestingly, at Davos and listening to the macroeconomists there, there's a higher probability of a soft landing than usual. Soft landings are very rare, and uh, I think we should recognize that it's not a high probability, but still there's a kind of sense the conditions may be pretty good for a soft landing. Now, why? Why is that? Well, the inflation rate uh, is coming down, and uh, it's, it, it is coming down uh, in, in, in the United States, we have core goods deflation. We have finally a slowing of shelter inflation. Uh, we don't have much in the way of services X housing, but still, if you put the whole indice, put all the indices together, I think we can say real action to bring the inflation rate down, real success. I look at wages. I, I look at wages. If you look at uh, nominal wage growth, the last report, the December report, it came in at 4.6% on an annual basis. That was below what the market anticipated. Look, the Fed can't bring the inflation rate down with nominal wage growth of in the neighborhood of 5%. It's coming down. That number's very good. And that creates room. See, the, the ideal soft landing is wage growth continues to slow and people, and to get that slowdown, we don't need a significant increase in the unemployment rate. If employers, and this is what it looks like is happening, they're holding on to their workers because it was so hard to get them. They're holding on to their workers. They're slowing down new hires. But actually, if that can be combined with a slowdown in the growth of wages, boy, that's conditions for a soft landing. Uh, so, Dr. Tyson, one last one here. Does China help or hurt in that soft landing? If it comes back, what does that do to, for example, commodities prices? So, very, very interesting question. And uh, 
the, there is a real plus to China coming back because China is a growth engine of the world economy. And um, it also can help pull a lot of the emerging markets around the world that have been uh, that have slowed significantly because of China's slowdown. So that's all very positive news. On the other hand, China is a major uh, demander of commodities and particular and oil. And so there is an anticipation that you have higher pressure on those kinds of prices from the Chinese recovery, China recovery, but you also have a plus on the growth side. So it's a mixed, it's a mixed situation. On balance, I think people believe that it's a plus for the world economy for China's recovery. Okay, Laura, thank you so much. And once again, thank you for your patience and waiting with us for, for President Biden. That's Laura Tyson. She's professor at the UC Berkeley Haas School of Business and Public Policy. And now for a reaction from Capitol Hill, we turn to Democratic Representative Brendan Boyle of Pennsylvania. He's a member of the Appropriations Committee. So, Congressman, first of all, before talking about the debt ceiling, give us your immediate reaction to this decision by the President of the United States to send M1 Abrams tanks to Ukraine. Well, uh, great to be back with you, David. I'm very supportive of it. Uh, I was part of a congressional delegation that met with Chancellor Schultz last week. Um, I have been a strong advocate for the U.S. doing absolutely everything we can to support the Ukrainian fight for freedom. I believe it's our fight for freedom <coughs> as well. Uh, so I think that this is very good news and, frankly, a very bad day for Vladimir Putin. Uh, and so I don't want to be flip about this in any way, but to put it bluntly, can we afford them, given what's going on with the debt ceiling? I mean, we, we're running yeah. up all these bills, but there's some question whether we're going to pay the bills. Uh, so I can always tell when there's a Democrat in the White House, because that's when my Republican colleagues immediately discover the deficit and the debt as an issue. Didn't really hear much about it in the four years Donald Trump was president, but now suddenly it's, it's back on the agenda. Let's look at the facts. The deficit has come down the last two years by $1.7 trillion. That is the fastest and uh, greatest deficit reduction in any two-year period in American history. Um, I think that really the main focus right now should be making sure we get, as Professor Tyson was talking about, that soft landing, that we don't jeopardize our record job creation with a 50-year unemployment or 50-year low in the unemployment rate, but that we don't, in attempting to bring down inflation, run into a situation in which we inadvertently cause unemployment to spike. So, Congressman, as I understand, at least from a distance here, where we are right now is the Democrats are saying to the Republicans, okay, what is your plan for the debt ceiling? Uh, we're not know if they're going to come up with a plan or not, but if they do, it'll include, no doubt, some spending cuts. If they do do that, are you going to respond? Because we've heard you're not going to negotiate. On the other hand, you've asked for a plan. Yeah, well, let's be clear, um, and don't take my word for it. Here's what House Speaker Kevin McCarthy has said, and the number two Republican leader in the Senate, John Thune, has said. They have outright said they plan to use raising the debt ceiling as leverage, essentially take that hostage in order to get in return cuts to Social Security and Medicare. We Democrats are not going to go along with that, period. Um, now, if we want to have a conversation about what future spending looks like, keeping in mind, as you know, the debt ceiling is about past spending, by the way, past spending that many of the Republican colleagues of mine voted for, um, that's one conversation on the debt ceiling, a separate conversation is what future spending looks like. We're going to have to have that by September 30th anyway, because that's when the government runs out of money. Um, so we're obviously going to have a conversation about future spending one way or the other. We don't have to jeopardize the full faith and credit of the United States in order to have it. So, so I wonder, and this is both a political question in terms of what your constituents think, but also a policy question. Should we be concerned with the deficit? As I uh, calculated, something like $8 trillion was added to the deficit under President Trump. That's over four years. And we've added another $4 trillion on two years under President Biden. That sounds like a lot of money to me. Yeah, I, well, I would remind you what a former, a recent Republican vice president once said, Dick Cheney. He famously said on Meet the Press 20 years ago, deficits don't matter. Uh, now, I don't necessarily subscribe to, to that view, but what I would point out is, look, just a few years ago, we had a complete shutdown of the worldwide economy. We had um, trillions of dollars in emergency spending, both under a Republican president and a Democratic president. The overwhelming majority of us in Congress voted for that. And guess what? We've come out of COVID now the fastest growing economy on earth. That's something we should be proud of. Um, so uh, let's focus on the here and now to make sure 
that uh, we keep this economic recovery growing, that we do tackle the inflation issue. Yes, there is a conversation in the long term to be had about debt, but let's not forget why we had that sudden run-up in deficit in the first place over the last several years. It, it was through an absolutely abnormal historic situation in world history. We've heard from uh, Senator Mitch McConnell, the minority leader over in the Senate, that basically this is between President Biden and the Speaker of the House, <laughs> Kevin McCarthy. Is that where it sits right now? And is there a possibility, do you think, of a deal? Because everybody seems to agree defaulting on debt really is not an option, is it? Yeah, I, well, first, I, I was struck that Mitch McConnell gave the Heisman to uh, Speaker McCarthy when it comes to this issue. And to be fair, Mitch McConnell has outright said uh, that we will raise the debt ceiling, that we will not jeopardize the full faith and credit of the United States. That's the responsible position. Um, Speaker McCarthy keeps talking about what exactly they, they want to get out of this. I've still yet to see any specifics on their side. It's almost as if they want to take the hostage first and then figure out why they're doing it later. I, I think a lot of Americans sit back and say, how can it be that we're really talking about defaulting on the debt? I'm not sure there's any country in the world that does this. Do you see, not necessarily right now, but in the longer term, some longer term solutions so we don't have this recurring all the time? Yeah, I'm so glad you asked about this. We are really the only country in the world that has this broken sort of debt ceiling process. Indeed, the only country on earth that even has a debt ceiling in addition to us is, is Denmark. But they don't go through this uh, annual uh, or uh, regular process of jeopardizing uh, the full faith and credit of their country. I'm the author of a bill called the Debt Ceiling Reform Act. Um, also have a, a lead co-sponsor in Senator Durbin in the Senate. What our bill simply would do is end once and for all this dysfunction around raising the debt ceiling, allow the executive branch to initiate an increase in future debt ceiling raises. Congress would still have a voice. It could vote to disapprove if it wanted. But what it would avoid is the situation that I most fear, and that is that we, we fail to raise the debt ceiling by accident. Um, there was a real danger of that happening in August 2011. Uh, as our politics have become more extreme and more dysfunctional, I want to make sure we permanently diffuse this ticking time bomb. Sounds like it makes sense to me, but uh, you know it far better than I. Thank you so much. Always great to have you with us. That's Democratic representative from Pennsylvania. He's Brendan Boyle. Still to come, we're going to talk with former Deputy Secretary General of NATO, Rose Guttemuller, about what Leopard and Abrams tanks will mean for the war in Ukraine. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. Well, the bad news is the equity markets are down the indices. The good news is they're not down as much as they were a short while ago. To take us through it, we welcome now Kriti Gupta. So, Kriti, where are we? Yeah, still a little bit of rough seas when it comes to the equity market. We're looking at S&P 500 that's down about nine-tenths of one percent. The real pain is in the tech space, though, uh, down about 1.3 percent on the Nasdaq. Now, a lot of this is coming from Microsoft earnings after the bell yesterday, essentially saying that their big moneymaker product, where a lot of their growth is coming from, their Azure cloud computing business, at the end of the day, it did great in the fourth quarter, but it might not do so well in the year ahead. A lot of that coming on those recessionary fears, the macroeconomic fears. And it's a sentiment, by the way, that has started to ripple across the tech sphere pretty broadly. You're looking at Amazon, Alphabet, a lot of the folks that are also looking to grow in the cloud computing business. Well, maybe we're not going to get that momentum we were really expecting. At least that seems to be the sentiment in the markets. But, David, it's not just the tech story we have to keep an eye on. It's also the geopolitics here, because on the under, or on the surface, it does look like most of tech is driving the action. But Look, it is a broad-based sell-off, which tells you risk sentiment really plays a story or plays a role in this uh, trading day. And a lot of it is coming from Ukraine. The idea mm -hmm. that the Biden administration has now agreed to send tanks to Ukraine, that increased presence, that increased involvement, that is seen as an increase in geopolitical risk as well. Yeah, we've come to the right place to talk about geopolitics here in Balance of Power. Thanks so much. But the, th the basic thought is it may increase geopolitical risk. It might increase geopolitical risk. And look, you're seeing that with the wonkiness of the dollar right now because yields were lower, the dollar not following yields, which tells you uh, there's a little bit of a bid there. A little safety. Okay, thank you so much to Gupta. You can watch her anchoring at 1 p.m. Eastern on Bloomberg Markets. Coming up, Rose Guttemuller of Stanford University takes us through Ukrainian preparations for new Russian offensive in the spring and what these tanks might mean to that. This is Balance of Power, and we are on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. To keep you up to date with news from all around the world, we turn now to Mark Crumpton here with The First Word. David, thank you. The United States will send Ukraine 31 of its M1 Abrams battle tanks, adding to a German commitment to supply some of its top line tanks. Speaking from the White House earlier this hour, President Biden said the tanks will help Ukraine achieve its changing strategic objectives. The decision by the U.S. and Germany follows a broader trend of allied nations giving Ukraine increasingly powerful weapons to counter Russia. Although food prices have declined over the past nine months, the world is still gripped by an historic food crisis. The war in Ukraine is hurting the flow of goods, including seeds, with much of Africa on the brink of famine. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N.'s Food and Agriculture Agencies, Cindy McCain, said it's going to be a, quote, tight year for funding food security agencies and projects. Canada's finance minister is facing significant pressure to spend more on clean energy subsidies and health care even as a possible recession looms. Christia Freeland says she'll continue to take a, quote, fiscally prudent approach as the government prepares its budget for the fiscal year that begins April 1st. She's vowing not to stoke inflation that could force the Bank of Canada to raise interest rates even higher. Pope Francis is calling for a change in the Catholic Church's approach to homosexuality. The Pope told the Associated Press that bishops in particular must be welcoming and show respect. He said homosexuality is not a crime and that the church should work to end laws in place, some countries that criminalize homosexuality and discriminate against the community. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Mark Crumpton. This is Bloomberg David. Thank you so much, Mark. Well, we started the broadcast with President Biden announcing the 31 M1 Abrams tanks we sent over to Ukraine, as Mark just described. And that came after the German Chancellor Olaf Scholz had earlier said what they're going to do from Germany. Our goal is to quickly provide two tank battalions together with our allies. There are many countries that would like to supply, and we will coordinate that and involve them to make that happen step by step. So we know the tanks are on their way. The question is, what difference will they make? And for an answer to that, we turn to Rose Gottemuller of Stanford University. Ms. Gottemuller served as Deputy Secretary General of NATO, and before that as Under Secretary of State for arms control. So thank you so much for being back with us. It sounds like a lot of tanks. At the same time, I've read that there are hundreds of Ukrainian tanks, and I don't know how many Russians. Why will this make a difference on the battlefield? I think it'll make a difference because these are the most capable battle tanks in the world today. The Leopards are well known for being reliable, for being capable. And uh, I think the fact that they are deployed across the European NATO allies and also NATO partners such as Finland, who have offered up tanks, I think that this will give the uh, Ukrainians a, a really strong offensive capability, which will be important in terms of pushing back. I should say counteroffensive, because we're all expecting the Russians to launch an offensive in the spring, and the Ukrainians really need the ability to fight back against that, to push back with armored vehicles, not only tanks, but personnel carriers, other ways of moving troops rapidly on the battlefield. So to make a long story short, I think this is a, a great first step. Getting from um, an initial company of 14 tanks, which is what the Germans are talking about, to, uh, to three to four companies, two battalions, that's between 80 and 100 tanks in approximation. That's going to take a lot of work, and it's going to take a lot of NATO allies and partners to make that happen. Well, actually, President Biden used the same word you did, counteroffensive, is what they're really talking about for the Ukrainians. Uh, do you have a sense of how long it will take to get the Leopard 2 tanks in place? I assume that's going to be uh, uh, possible to do that faster than the M1 Abrams. Yes, I believe so. I've understood from, from what I've been reading that the Poles are already uh, training the Ukrainians in Poland on their leopards, waiting for permission from the Germans to send them. This is a requirement of, of German sale of these tanks that uh, anybody who's going to pass them along to third parties gets permission. It's an important export control rule, but it stood in the way of getting these tanks moving quickly to the Ukrainians. But Poles have already been training the Ukrainians. Now the Germans will start training the Ukrainians on German soil. 
So I think that we should be able to see some uh, some of these tanks in place within a couple of months. Now, the Abrams tank, which is the U.S. tank on offer, again, it looks like from what I hear, 31 tanks, that's, that's two companies approximately. So this will take longer because not only is the training going to be very intense, but they also have a logistics trail. And this has been part of the problem as far as the, the uh, administration is concerned in Washington. Can they really make sure that they the Ukrainians have the maintenance trail in place, the jet fuel? Everybody's been talking about the jet fuel that these engines take. Uh, so that will take some work and some time as well. But I'm sure that the Pentagon's worked through all these details and uh, they've got in mind how to get them the fuel and the maintenance and the training that they need. Uh, Ms. Gordon, what about the other side of the equation? By that, I mean Russia. Do we have any sense of what's going on in and around Vladimir Putin? And specifically, I have read now that the Wagner Group may be on the decline, that in fact they're not in his favor at the moment. Uh, I wouldn't count on that. The Wagner Group has been the fist, really, for the Russians at the moment. The Ukrainians I've read this morning have, have moved out of Solidar now, the small salt mining town in eastern Ukraine. Uh, the Russians are still fighting hard with the Ukrainians around Bakhmut. So, and this is all Wagner Group action. So the successes, quote unquote, that the Russians have had, very small ones, have been on the back of the Wagner Group and a lot of apparently deaths of Wagner conscript soldiers, uh, not conscripts, but rather soldiers on contract and also prisoners that they've gotten out of Russian uh, jails and, and prison camps. And so they've been really, I would say, the, the point of the spear at this time for, for Putin's uh, invasion of Ukraine. And so I wouldn't count on them being out of favor, at least uh, for long. Um, but it is true that they have taken very heavy losses. The question I've had in my mind is if what we're looking at next is concern about a Russian uh, armored uh, advance and offensive in the spring, are those kinds of troops trained for that? Are they trained for combined arms warfare? I, I really have my doubts. Uh, on the Ukrainian side, there are reports now that several senior officials, including a deputy defense minister, have been sacked reportedly because of some irregularities in their defense spending. Do we know much about that? I think, frankly, Zelensky is trying to get ahead of any concerns about corruption in Ukraine. He's been very clear that this will not be allowed with any of the assistance coming from the NATO allies and partners. He wants to really make sure that that the message gets across that he's going to be very tough on corruption and crack down. And as he has said, he wants to come out of this war with Ukraine in a different place, ready for EU membership, ready for NATO membership. That means they have to cut back on their corruption and really they really have to to crush it. So I think that's part of the message here. I think also part of the message is apparently, as we like to say, the dogs are fighting under the rug. And uh, apparently there are some in the Zelensky administration who are uh, wanting to be on top and, and trying to push others down. So there could be some aspect of that going on as well. I at least have not heard recently of Vladimir Putin, the president of Russia, talking about nuclear arms. Uh, what do you make of that? I'm mindful of the fact that you were under Secretary of State before being in NATO for arms control. Uh, do you think that that threat of uh, some nuclear device being used has gone down or are we just not paying attention to it? And by the way, as we add these tanks, does it increase that threat? It's very interesting, looking at what Dmitry Peskov had to say this morning, the, the uh, Kremlin spokesman, he basically has said, oh, it's not going to make any difference to the fight. Uh, they'll, they'll burn just like the other ones. These are too high tech for the Ukrainians to operate. Uh, so the tanks are going to fail. They won't make any difference. So they're trying to dismiss this as an additional threat or an additional problem for them in this fight. And I find that very, very interesting. But there have been some spokespeople, officials, like uh, Medvedev, uh, Dmitry Medvedev, who is uh, on the, the Defense Council in, in uh, Moscow and, and very high in the leadership. And he has continued to voice these nuclear threats. So I would say, yes, in some ways, it's not Putin who's, uh, who's brandishing the nuclear saber mm -hmm. anymore, but there are Russian officials who are doing so. Okay, Rose, it's always such a pleasure and really beneficial to have you with us at Stanford University lecturer Rose Guttemuller. Coming up, Texas goes after financial firms taking environmental, social, and governance into account in making their investment decisions. We'll talk about how and why with Bloomberg's Danielle Moran. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio.
This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David Weston. There was a time not too long ago when ESG, environmental, social, and governance investing was all the rage, but now it's become something of a political hot potato in quite a number of states here in the United States of America. One of those is Texas. And we now have a profile on the Bloomberg of the man in Texas who's responsible for administering this question about whether state funds can be invested in financial firms taking ESG into account. Daniel Moran wrote that uh, profile, and she joins us now. So thanks so much for the profile. Thanks for being with us. So tell us about Glenn Hagar. So Glenn Hager is the Texas controller of public accounts. So basically what that means is that he's the state CFO. His normal day-to-day -day job is the check writer, the revenue estimator. He collects the taxes that Texas brings in. But during the last legislative session, he was given a new duty. And that was to create this kind of naughty list of financial <laughs> firms that Texas deems to boycott the oil and gas industry. And so... He spent months along with his staff going through, pouring through documents, looking at firm's policies, and ended up coming up with a list that had 10 companies on it and more than 300 individual funds that are now subject to divestment from Texas entities. Well, so the legislator told him to do this. So it's not just him doing it on his own. The legislator, you go do this. Yes. But did they give him criteria or ways of determining which ones would go on the, as you say, naughty list yeah. or not? <laughs> it was fairly open-ended. He was given this directive from the legislature after they passed a law called Senate Bill 13. And it, he had to come up with a list, come up with criteria, try and figure out what was the best way to approach this. And given his personality, he has a reputation in Texas of being pretty low key, pretty methodical, um, uh, adult hand in a lot of the politics there. So it seemed like a good fit for his office. As I understand it, this is environmental, not not all of ESG. It's particularly the E part of environmental. Is it just a coincidence that Texas is such a big fossil fuel state? I mean, that's a huge part of it. Fossil fuels is a big part of the Texas economy, although it is more diversified than it once was. But this is an oil and gas list, and um, Hager will tell you that. He said that this is an environmental policy. Although Texas legislation has come out against other types of ESG criteria, they have a similar law that prohibits gov government contracts with companies that um, what they call discriminate against the firearms industry. So it's just this ripple effect that it's been having. So he has the list, as I understand it. Yes. And he wrote a letter. Have they mm -hmm. started disinvesting? Have any financial firms felt the, the thrust of this so far? So the entities that have been impacted, which are pension funds and other state-level investments, have divested from company stock of um, the listed firms, and then if they held any of the funds. Um, but that list is flexible. It will be updated as often, or it's required to be updated annually and can be often updated as often as quarterly. A uh, final question for me, and, and that is, how much of this is tied to the investment performance of these firms in taking into account environmental concerns, and how much of it is just we don't like politically the values of ESG? I mean, it definitely goes back and forth. A lot of the core crux of this debate is if you limit investment in oil and gas, does that hurt uh, consumers as energy prices could increase? And um, so there is could be an economic impact to that. And another part of it is, is uh, it's a very hot button political issue right now and probably will continue to be one um, as we go through the legislative session. Okay, thank you so much, Danielle. Terrific piece by Danielle Moran on the Bloomberg about this program in Texas. Coming up, we're going to talk with the man who's put together and is administering that ESG plan. He's Glenn Hager. He is controller of the state of Texas. That's coming up next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and on radio. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg Television and Radio. I'm David West, and we just heard about the Texas program initiated by the legislature, now being administrated by the executive branch, that deals with financial firms who take into account environmental issues as they make their investments, and specifically which funds in the state of Texas get to work with those firms going forward. We now turn to the man who's responsible for administering this. He's Glenn Hager. He is Comptroller of the state of Texas. So, Mr. Hager, thank you so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. First of all, just give us a sense from your point of view, how do you decide 
decide who is put on this list and who is not? Because I've heard talk about boycotting oil and gas, but there are a lot of firms like BlackRock, for example, who certainly don't boycott oil and gas. Yeah, no, that's a great question. One of the things that we've tried to do very hard is nobody's ever done anything like this. So we were given a task by the state legislature, pretty broad realm of how we come up with this list. We've done a significant amount of research before we ever started the process. First, we have to identify those financial institutions that are publicly traded. So we utilize Bloomberg services to help us identify those over 700 financial institutions. Then secondly, start the process of identifying who is in the top tier half of ESG related. Most people think this is an ESG list, but it's a subpart of environmental. As you said, boycotting oil and gas, it's not S nor G of ESG. So that we identified that. And as we go through, then we look at companies and say, okay, these might be companies that would be on the list. Now, when I say on the list, boycotting can be not necessarily the Webster definition. It is the statutory definition the legislature passed. And what that essentially means is you could be engaged currently in the oil and gas industry. However, engaging in activity that is not in your ordinary business functions, one that is limiting current and future engagement in the oil and gas industry, any type of efforts to harm that industry. So that's where some people look at this and say, well, wait, this institution actually is engaged in the oil and gas. Yes, but activities from here going forward are limiting those activities. And that's how some got on the list. Well, this is one of my questions. And I think a lot of Bloomberg audience would wonder about this. How do you know why they're limiting it? Suppose they are limiting it. It is possible that an investor would say, look, I'm going to invest it not because I have anything against oil and gas, but because I think there are risks associated with that business in terms of its future growth because of regulatory anticipations, what's going on with climate. And so I think it's not as an attractive an investment as it otherwise be. That might be in the ordinary course of business as opposed to I just have a position on climate. Yeah, say, for example, 19 of the companies that we sent information to and asked them to help us identify, and we, we want to hear from these companies. We wanted to have their information answer our questions because we think it's imperative to have that dialogue and make sure that we have the best, most accurate information as we are coming up with this list. And as we will going forward, whether it's in a year that we have to update it or every quarter when we deem that we need to update it, but that dialogue is important. And my point in coming to, say, for example, one of the companies wrote back and said, yep, this is... This is our business model. This is what we're doing. We boycott the industry, and we're very proud of that. And so that healthy dialogue is important, which I respect if that's their business model. But one of the major issues here is that in my concern personally, I think the state of Texas and the legislature, is there's not really a good intellectually honest conversation about this topic. And also, I understand we're going to have electric vehicles. We're going to have moving in that direction. Texas, as a diversity in our energy portfolio, we have a very diverse energy portfolio. We are one of the states that has a higher concentration in use of wind power in the state of Texas, higher in solar power in the state of Texas. So we're not just an oil and gas state. We believe in having all the eggs in the basket for that energy diversity. But with that being said, there are so many things that we utilize every single day in our lives that are petroleum based. If you drive an electric vehicle, whether it's the tires that make it go round, the seat that you sit in, the wires that coat the components, the battery set in a tub of plastic. So therefore that petroleum industry is going to continue to be important into the future. And I think that's really the concern here in part is that intellectually honest conversation and being able to understand the connectivity of why that industry is still important today, will still be important in the future. And if we stifle that industry and we do not allow investments in that industry, then we're going to have significant issues that unfortunately in an earlier segment Y'all were talking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine. And so, therefore, as the disruptions in the market, now we see higher natural gas prices than we've had in quite some time. In part, why? Because of the disruption that has occurred worldwide with that invasion and the disruption in the market. So yeah. part of this point, we need to have that intellectual conversation. We need to make sure that we understand why we're doing this. The environment is important but we need to have a balance in the portfolio. Yeah, and I must say, as we talk to people from the oil and gas industry, but also for people on the, from, the, from the climate, the environmental side, typically both of them agree there has to be some transition. Both sides say that. The question is sort of how fast the transition is, how we get there. But you also have a fiduciary duty, I assume, to all the pension plan holders, for example, people you have to pay pension plans for. How do those fit together with some of the more policy-oriented situations you have? Suppose you had a company that you knew is going to make money for your more money for your pension plan, but they did really cut back on oil and gas. How do you decide that question? 
So that's why in the state legislation, the legislature enabled that each entity that this applies to, whether it's our employee retirement system, our teacher retirement system, our municipal retirement systems, our permanent school fund, all of those entities have the ability to look at their fiduciary responsibility to those that they are entrusted to invest their money. And so therefore that is a counterbalance and ability to make sure that if there is a right reason for investing with these companies or having doing business with them, then they have that capability because that comes first and foremost is your fiduciary responsibility. Now, some that I've interviewed would said, oh, well then that makes the legislation hollow. No, it doesn't because first and foremost, in my opinion, us having this discussion, me being on with you today, David, having this conversation raises the discussion to what I deem is a much more intellectually honest conversation that we need to make sure we have a yeah. balance in use of energy, that we also are taking yeah. care of the environment and we're not being overreactive yeah. and let's not invest in oil because it sounds bad yeah. today when in deem it's not making a better return on investment. Well, it certainly is important to have that conversation. No question about it. Thank you so much for being here to help us with that conversation. He's Glenn Hager. He's the controller of the state of Texas. Check out the Balance of Power newsletter on the terminal and online. Coming up, Balance of Power continues on Bloomberg Radio. Our second hour, we're going to talk to the man who was in the room the last time we averted a debt ceiling crisis. This is Bloomberg.